Howdy and welcome. This is Matt with Drill Team Dynamics, and today we are going to dive into um, a topic that's very, very important if you attend competitions that use this particular thing. But this is probably one of the least fully understood concepts in all of competitive junior ROTC drill. And we are, of course, talking about proportional scoring. So uh, in this presentation, we are going to talk about uh, what the heck is it and what are some examples of how this works in real life and what can we do or how can we change our strategy or use this uh, knowledge for um, the betterment of our drill teams. So without further ado, we're going to dive right in. And we know that this is one of those topics that desperately needs an explainer because everywhere we travel, we ask teams, hey, um, how do you win the drill meet? You guys are going to a meet. It uses proportional scoring. How do you win? And everyone kind of looks around the room and they say, uh, by scoring the most points, by being really good, by making the least number of mistakes. And it's like, yes, those things are all true. But the scoring the most points thing is where proportional points and proportional scoring really comes into play. So first and foremost, what is proportional scoring? If you attend a drill meet and many of our top uh, service type drill meets or regional or national type drill meets utilize this proportional scoring system, um, proportional scoring is just a method of determining the overall placements at a drill meet. And we do that um, by taking the events and we take the points that teams earn and we do some math and we come out with the overall winner of the championship. Right. So that's all it is in a nutshell. Here's kind of what we're going to dive into. OK, so here's how this works. Each event. So regulation, color guard, inspection, exhibition, for example, each event is given a specific number of what we call proportional points. Uh, and that number is found in the SOP. Right. Usually it's a thousand or twelve hundred. And the winner of an event, no matter what they score on their score sheets, is automatically given the top proportional score. So many times um, we do proportional scoring in meets that we're asked to facilitate and teams will come back and say, how did the first place teams all get a perfect score? Well, no, they probably didn't. The way proportional scoring works is whoever is the highest scoring team in that event automatically gets that proportional score. Um, and again, that's set by the SOP. Every other team after the first place team receives a portion of points that's relative to their spread from the first place team based on their raw score from the judges. And if that sounds like gibberish, uh, we're going to keep going here. So here's some terms that we need to know. Uh, proportional points. These are the points that are awarded to a team towards their overall finish. So the event points are one thing. The proportional points um, are what goes towards the overall. When we talk about raw points in this presentation, raw points are the actual points awarded to the team by the judges on a score sheet. So when they strike uh, pen to paper, um, those are the raw points that we're talking about. When we talk about spreads, we're talking about the difference in points between two teams. That could be raw point difference or that could be proportional point difference. And spreads become very important in the proportional scoring world. Um, and so we're going to be talking about that quite a bit. Last but not least, we're going to talk about point values. And this is the value of a single raw point when converted to proportional points for an overall placement, right? So let's look at an example of how this would work. And this is a common example provided in many SOPs uh, nationwide. Here's how this looks. All right. So we have our event. We don't know what event this is. Let's call it uh, inspection. OK, so first place team, first place team gets 900 points from the judges. They are the winning team. The highest score awarded to any team in this event was 900 points because 900 is 100 percent of 900 they're going to get the proportional points that the SOP uh, tells them that they will get for winning. And in this case, it appears to be 1,000 points. If you win the event, no matter what your raw score, you will get 1,000 proportional points towards the overall championship. Now, here's where the spreads come into play. The second place team, apparently in this example, got 810 points. 810 is 90% of 900. So we're looking at the spread between raw points, right? Because 8 110 points is 90% of 900, they're going to receive 900 proportional points because 900 is 90% of 1,000. And it continues on down. 788, apparently that is 87.6% of 900, right? Therefore, they get 87, 876 points, which is 877.6% of 
the 1,000 proportional points. And if that seems pretty uh, crazy, um, it is. It's just that simple is over of equals percent over 100, and we're doing the math all the way down, and it's based on that spread again between the first place score and the scores happening underneath that. So here's that. That's kind of the example. So I want you to look at that. And this is where most uh, groups stop. They understand that, hey, the winner is going to get this many proportional points per the SOP. And then they understand that everyone else is going to get a percentage of points relative to the winner. And we don't quite go deeper than that. So now let's dive in to the possible scenarios with proportional scoring. So here is the ideal scenario. And this probably will never happen. And we'll talk about it. Um, but the ideal scenario is when your raw points that you earn, the raw points that are possible, are equal to the proportional points assigned by the SOP to that particular event. When that is the case, every raw point that a judge strikes to a score sheet is worth one point towards the overall championship. And this is kind of um, in an idealized scenario. Uh, this would be what happens. But it doesn't ever happen. And there's a couple reasons that this will never happen. First and foremost, a good judge's brief will tell the judges you don't want to give anyone a perfect score unless it's the very last group and you know that they're the winner. And even then, is anyone really perfect, right? Does that does that perfect score reflect their performance level? And so you're not really going to see a, a, a scenario where the winning team is maximizing their points. Even in that scenario, it would require the total number of raw points available to the judges on their score sheets to equal the proportional points that the SOP assigns. And this may or may not be the case, right? So for that reason, we're never going to see uh, in functional reality a winning team that earns the same total points as their proportional points uh, would allot them for winning. Also, the number of judges can have an impact on the raw points even available. For example, let's say a meet is short-staffed and there's 1,200 proportional points for uh, regulation drill in the SOP but there are only two regulation judges, right? So now their raw total can only be X, you know, add sheet one and sheet two. And that would be different than a scenario with four judges when all four score sheets would total a different number. Um, and so for a variety of reasons, we're not going to see a scenario probably where the raw points awarded by the judges equals the proportional points, thereby making one point that a judge awards worth one point towards the overall championship. Instead, we are probably going to see one of these scenarios. Here's, here's the first one. The less ideal scenario, more realistic scenario, one of them is when the raw points earned by the top finisher in an event are less than the proportional points allotted to an event. So in this example, for instance, uh, the raw points that the top team earned was 400. They went to 1,200 for this event per the SOP. But if you look here, Every time you have a score, because of how we do the, the math, every time you have a raw point score underneath the proportional point total, the value of every one raw point increases when you do the math towards the proportional points and the overall. So in this particular example, when the top team earned 400 points, their score went to 1,200 uh, proportionally towards the overall. Every one point a judge struck to their score sheet became worth three points towards that overall championship, meaning the gap has increased there, right? Um, and so anytime the raw points are less than the proportional points, you're going to see the points inflate in that event towards the overall championship. In other words, it's going to be weighted more heavily towards the overall championship. Um, this definitely applies to events like Color Guard. Um, we looked at the average winning scores at national level type events uh, since COVID, and the average winning score of a Color Guard was apparently uh, 1,040 uh, and two-thirds. Um, 0.66 repeating. And this is obviously less than the 1,200 proportional points assigned to it in the SOP, meaning that color guard, one point that a color guard judge strikes is generally going to be worth more than one point towards an overall championship. And pre-COVID, when we went back and looked before COVID, that number was even lower. Sometimes um, an average score over a span of years might be 800 points, uh, which is definitely lower than the proportional value allotted by most SOPs. So this is, this is the first uh, scenario that may occur. Remember that if your raw points earned by the winning team are fewer than the points allotted by the SOP, one point is always worth more than one point towards the overall. The second scenario, uh, also realistic, less ideal, is the inverse, right? Where the raw points that a team earns are, as a winner are greater than the proportional points offered 
by that event per the SOP. Um, and so in this particular example, if the winning team earned 2,000 raw points from all their judges and the event was worth 1,200 points in the SOP, when we do the math to bring the overall uh, standings you know, into clarity, every single point in this event, when the score was above the proportional points, became worth less than one point towards the overall. In this case, if the winner got 2,000 raw points and it was converted to 1,200 proportional points, Every one point awarded by a judge now was worth 0.6 points towards the overall. And this generally applies to events like regulation drill, uh, where most score sheets across the country are typically themselves, when you add them all together, worth more, just worth more points in general uh, than the 1,200 that's typically or the 1,000 that's typically allotted to them in the SOP. The most important thing that we remember is every time a raw point winner goes above the proportional points, every point that they earn becomes worth less than one point towards that overall championship. So now let's look and see kind of how this actually plays out in quote unquote real time. Obviously, these are fictitious examples, uh, but they're based on real life scenarios. And you'll see the school names are completely fabricated. Uh, but we want to show you this uh, so that you can see how we can look at the scores. And I think the biggest takeaway will be um, it's not quite as simple as just looking at the math and looking at the numbers and just saying, hey, this team was clearly stronger than this team. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. So uh, in our first example, we're going to look at uh, color guard. Okay, And this table right here that you see in front of you, um, this represents the overall standings for the color guard event at this particular competition. You can see here our winning team, the Fire Ferrets, earned a top score of 912 points. Um, and in the SOP, they get 1,200 points because that's what the SOP tells you the winner is going to get. Um, and if you recall, this number, this 912, was less than 1,200. We know that the points are going to inflate. In other words, every one point that the color guard judges said you earned becomes more than one point towards your overall championship. So if we go on down the line, you can kind of see how this looks. The Badger Moles commanding second place team scored 851. The raw point difference between 912 and 851 is 61 points. When you do the math and convert to proportional scoring, that 61 point gap in the event has become an 80 point gap in proportional points from the first place team. So that gap got bigger raw to proportional. And we look at the point value over here, right? Um, every one point struck in color guard in this particular competition was worth 1.32 points towards the overall championship. And this continues on down the line. The Tiger Dillos uh, was an 848. That's a 64 point spread from first place. That 64 point spread became 84 points towards the overall and so on and so forth. So this is a perfect example of when a top uh, scoring team does not earn points equal to or greater than the proportional score allotted to them. And you can see uh, every point in color guard became more valuable as a result. Next, we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to look at an example from regulation. Uh, and in this case, the fire ferrets came out on top. Their score was a 1410 um, and 1200 proportional points allotted per the SOP. Uh, but here we have the scenario where their top score is above that proportional score. And so in this case, every single point struck by a judge in regulation drill became worth 0.85 points towards the overall championship. The second place team, the Cat Gators, scored a 13.21. That's an 89 point raw point difference. It's a pretty sizable gap. But when we do the math to the proportional scores, it only becomes a 76 point gap. So that gap has gone backwards. That big, nice open lead has shrunk once we take the event scores and we move them to the overall proportional scores. And so on down the line, the Moose Lions score 13-12, 98-point gap from first place of 14-10, uh, but that only became an 83-point difference from first place in the overall standings, right? So this is a perfect example of what happens when the score is higher by the winning team uh, than the proportional score allotted in the SOP. Every point becomes, quote-unquote, less valuable, and the spreads between teams uh decrease as we talk to about that overall championship. Okay, here's an exhibition example, exhibition drill. Um, in this particular case, the Moose Lions came out on top with a score of 905, proportionally uh, worth 1,200 for the SOP. 
Um, and in this particular case, again, that top score is underneath the proportional score. Therefore, uh, we know that every point's going to inflate towards that overall championship. So we have a point value of 1.33, meaning that every one point in exhibition that was struck to a page is worth one and a third points towards the overall championship. Our fire ferrets came in uh, second place with an 893. Um, and that was a raw point difference of 12 from first place. But because every point's worth more than a point, it became a 16 point difference uh, in the overall standings. The Badger Moles, same thing, uh, 869. Uh, 36 point gap in the raw points in the event became a 48 point gap in the overall championship. Um, and so again, an example of what happens when uh, the top score is beneath the proportional score. Now, here's a real life example um, of something that really did happen. Obviously, everything is fictitious here, but check this out, right? This is an inspection, inspection uh, finish that we're looking at. In this particular inspection, the score sheet that they used only had a total of 400 points. It was 100 points per score sheet, and there were four judges doing the inspection, therefore a maximum score of 400. But in this particular case, the SOP said, hey, it's still worth 1,000 points when you win inspection. So check out what happens here. Our fire ferrets uh, score a 313 on their inspection. 313 is a lot less than 1,000. Check out what happens here. Every one point in an inspection in the raw scores becomes 3.19 points towards the overall championship at this particular event, meaning that the inspection score is weighted more heavily than anything else that we've looked at before. And then the math stays the same in the same way. Uh, the Badger Moles get a 3.07. Uh, they, their six-point gap from first place, though, here, because every point's worth 3.19, that six point gap, that really narrow margin uh, that they were in second place, when you convert that to the overall championship, it's 19 points out of first place. So this would tell you, hey, this was a close fight. But when we add that back in because of the difference between the raw points awarded and the proportional points granted, we see that that gap multiplies exponentially. And so what does that tell us for this inspection is that this event is more weighted towards that overall championship. If every inspection point is worth 3.19, every exhibition point is worth 1.33, every regulation point is worth uh, 0.85, and every color guard point is worth 1.32, we might come to the conclusion that the least mathematically important event in this competition is regulation drill, and the most valuable event, the most important event, is the inspection, right? And I think this is this is somewhat um, counterintuitive. I think most people would assume that the regulation event is probably the, the foundational event um, of the drill competition. But as we can see here, because of proportional scoring and the tendency of these scores uh, to be either higher or lower, we have an interesting scenario on our hands. So then the question is, what do we do about knowing this stuff? Because I think the, the, the next piece of the puzzle is maybe the part that's a little bit less intuitive. Um, and we have to start talking about volatility and subjectivity in the events. So here are the takeaways for us. And this is just kind of how we as Drill Team Dynamics advise teams take a look at uh, this data. Um, and we encourage them to look at their competitions over the years um, and start to get an idea of what their competitions look like. And here's how we encourage them to kind of think about this events with higher variance in their top scores or with higher subjectivity, just hard baked into that event, right? Year over year, we consider those to be volatile events. In other words, we don't really know what we're going to get. It could change year over year, depending on any number of factors, including the judges um, or the briefing that the judges receive, et cetera, et cetera. Usually, though not always, right? You have to look at the score sheets and look at the event. Usually that's the inspection event. And it's nearly always, I say nearly just to make sure I'm not and, you know, I'm hedging my bet here. It's probably always exhibition drill because exhibition drill is obviously the most subjective event, um, probably out of all four events. And it's harder to control scores and, and do things that, that are within our control at practice or at competition when the event itself is subjective and volatile. On the flip side, events that have controllable variables, right? Things that we can do at practice, things that we can do at the competition uh, to ensure that we try to set ourselves up really well. Um, these events are going to be the focus when our goal is to win an overall championship. And these events um, are typically 
color guard, and regulation drill. So here's kind of the strategies as they break out per event using that as like the basis, right? Color guard. We want to maximize the score knowing that the point values are likely to inflate when we go from raw score to proportional score. Um, we know that this is likely to be one of those areas where every one point becomes worth more than one point. There's so many factors in color guard that we are in control of. For example, are we performing characteristically of our service and of our manual? Um, are we, uh, do we have that high level of execution with those four cadets? Because it's only four, right? Um, this is one of those great equalizing events for many schools, whether you have a drill team of 100 people or a drill team of five people, right? Uh, four people are controlling it. Therefore, we want to maximize that score, knowing that the point values are going to inflate and help us out. Now, I mentioned before, regulation drill tends to slide backwards, but we're going to try to maximize that score knowing that the point values are likely to go backwards. In other words, in other words if we know that every one point is going to be worth less than one point, we want to work to gain as many points as possible to minimize the impact of that backward slide towards the overall championship. And there are multiple cases in the past where doing that, had the slide been any greater and that padding not been there, may have changed the result of the overall championship just because maybe regulation wasn't prioritized as highly as we'd probably prioritize it. So for us, color guard and regulation, it's all about trying to maximize what we can control to achieve the highest scores knowing what the tendency of the points are in those two events. So then other things, right? Um, typically speaking for exhibition, we treat this as an enjoy. It should be fun. It should be enjoyable. We should be trying to create awesome moments for our teams and for our cadets. We want to do things that they're going to enjoy. Obviously, we're still going to, uh, we're still going to emphasize quality of execution, right? But listen, volatility is high. We cannot control a number of variables like what are the judges being told about exhibition? What is their history with exhibition, if any, right? The high level of volatility tells us that this is not a key event that we're going to spend, um, you know, all of our competitive strategy energy on simply because we can't predict it quite as well as the other two events we've talked about. Inspection, right? Regardless of how the inspection looks for your particular set of competitions, if you even have inspection, um, we want to focus on the controllable variables like the uniforms and the hygiene and all these kind of things that we know that we can maximize by working really hard in advance of the competition. We want to control those and hope for the best because by and large, there is a lot of subjectivity in uh, inspection depending on um, your inspection schematic, right? Different services treat it differently. Um, for example, we would say that there's more volatility in the army or all service model for inspection. And there's a lot less volatility in the Navy or Marine Corps model. And that's just by virtue of the score sheets, right? Ultimately, more teams, most teams probably out there are overvaluing, giving too much time, too much attention, too much energy to their exhibition while undervaluing regulation. And at the same time, they're probably not giving enough scrutiny to their color guard um, and especially in how they choose to staff the color guard. Um, exhibition obviously is one of the most time consuming events from the standpoint that it takes a lot to work on that routine and then achieve it at a high level, right? Um, and regulation is one of those things that we quote unquote need to master first before we can move on. Therefore, the assumption is it's kind of a basic thing. Um, and many times we see teams that will split their time up to as much as 90, 10 exhibition to regulation, but the proportional math would tell us that may not be the strategy that we want to employ. When teams work with us, I think there's often this um, this very uh, wow. We're really we're really not thinking about exhibition like trying to maximize the score sheets and you know be competitive. Well, we're not because there's too much volatility. And historically speaking, um, exhibition has shifted based on any number of factors. What can we control? Do we love doing it? Because if we love doing it, the judges can feel how much the cadets love to perform that routine. How good are we uh, with that routine? Those are things that are in our control, but we're not really making that a central part of our strategy. Um, we're going to really focus in on color guard and regulation uh, and make those our ringer events uh, because mathematically they are the most important. Now, we could do an even deeper dive into the vast number of strategies uh, to maximize proportional scores in each event. You know, obviously that's one of the major things that we do with our on-site clients, especially those who compete 
um, and who are trying to compete at that high level where proportional scoring can really make the difference between a win or a loss. Um, but here's some general tips uh, that would help any team that competes with proportional scoring. Here we go. First and foremost, choose your color guard based first on availability and desire. A lot of people pick color guard by a lot of factors. Uh, height, experience level, rifle handling ability. I've done it before. I'm a higher rank. I've been on the team longer. We have found that because proportional scoring inflates the value of color guard, the most important factor, yes, those factors can all play a role. And, and we're not saying disregard those factors. But before you consider experience, before you consider rifle handling ability, look at who is available for practice consistently, who can be there like as often as is reasonably uh, possible, and look for who really has a strong desire to become great at it. If you pick your color guard based on those things, you can take the, someone with great desire is going to figure out they're going to go watch videos. Uh, we've we've had cadets who have said, "Wow, I really want to be a great guard on color guard." I went out and just searched for videos of great color guards, and wow, I really want to execute like those cadets that I saw. That's the drive that a good color guard cadet needs, because no matter how much you practice color guard formally, to maximize the score in color guard is going to require outside of practice work. The guards are going to have to want to get together on weekends and want to take water breaks instead of sitting down for five minutes, going through sling arms one more time, or syncing up their manual of arms even closer, right? The availability of a cadet and their desire to become great at it are the biggest factors that we have found in choosing a color guard. And speaking candidly, this is one of those areas that teams maybe um, pick things that are, pick color guards based on very logical things, but which maybe aren't the most important things as it concerns uh, overall scoring towards the championship at a drill meet. Next, Regulation drill, right? Regulation drill, we try to choose the team based on their mental maturity and their desire, again, their, their motivation. Because the attention to detail required, because regulation is such an important event and it comes down to such small details at the very, very top. We want cadets who are mentally mature enough to want to focus on those small details. We're talking about people who care whether their finger is like this or like this, and that like three millimeters just really eats them up because they want to be the best they can possibly be. Well, I think many times people say everyone's going to do regulation first, and we're going to then choose people that can do regulation really, really well. We would tell you at the end of the day, because it's so important towards the overall, we're looking for maturity, right? We're looking for um, a cadet who can stand still for a long time, and we're looking for someone who cares uh, because attention to detail requires a motivation to care. And so typically speaking, though not 100% of cases, uh, we don't tend to worry about the brand new drillers trying to assimilate and learn the regulation stuff. We want the ones who have been there for a while, who have built up that culture of like, I want to be really great at uh, my craft. Those are the people that we want to pull onto that regulation team, knowing that it's super important. I wouldn't staff people who are not suitable to such an important job to that particular job right? And going hand in hand with this, we would not recommend that every cadet learns and masters regulation drill before they can do exhibition drill. And here is why, right? We know that exhibition drill is volatile. And we know that one of the things that we can control is the quality of execution and achievement. Exhibition typically takes a long time to master. I want a new driller on that from day one. Not only because, one, it's more interesting and more fun, and that's likely to hook them to stay with the team and to become a part of the team, um, but two, I just want the sheer number of hours by the time they become a senior to be as maximized as possible. Now, if your exhibition practice is total chaos, this isn't going to work. But if it's a fun, performative event that requires great fundamentals and has structure when they're practicing, you're not going to lose anything. I think the fear is like if we don't make them master regulation first, which First and foremost, no one's mastering regulation drill in four years, let alone one year or a semester or a couple of weeks, that we're going to lose something if we let them go straight to exhibition. Great quality is great quality. Great execution is great execution. The points tell us that exhibition drill is something that we would start everyone on from the very beginning, and we would use that regulation team as like the top uh, team that everyone wants to be a part of that you really have to grind and you really have to earn your way to that team. And I think that puts regulation drill on the pedestal that it it truly deserves. And not only that, but 
hopefully everyone is doing DNC in their class periods for junior ROTC. It's not like they're losing regulation drill when their emphasis is on exhibition drill from day one. Okay. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle, uh, we would tell you to analyze your inspection score sheets. Use the, the score sheets to determine where the majority of your points come from. A lot of teams think the inspection, because it's the most visible, you know, uh, part of the inspection is the questions and answers. Um, but if you look at most sheets, you'll find that um, the questioning and answering portion is worth far less points than the uniforms and hygiene, for example. Those are controllable things that we can use, right? And if your score sheet is very objective in that way, I'm looking at like the Navy and Marine Corps score sheets, then you know that this could actually become an event where we can control uh, and use it to our advantage, knowing that our proportional points um, are likely to be higher than our raw points, right? In a subjective scenario, for example, if the entry and the exit into the inspection area involves a lot of points and there's a lot of overall impression type points um, or grading is being done per squad or per element versus per individual cadet, right? Those subjective things would tell us something different we would then treat that more as the exhibition in terms of not valuing it, you know, as heavily towards our overall strategy, control the things that we can control uh, and do our best with everything else. Um, so again, with the inspection, we would highly encourage you to look at your score sheets, do, a, you know, add up the point values in each category, find out what the most important categories are. That will tell you the role that inspection will play towards the overall championship at your particular meet and therefore how to treat it when we have proportional scoring coming into play. This was about as fast <laughs> and about as um, as thorough as we could do this in one go. Obviously, there is much more to discuss. If you have questions, if you're wondering about specific scenarios, if you're looking about, uh, you know, how can I do a deeper dive on some of these strategies as it concerns practice and staffing my teams, um, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we love to talk about this. We'd be happy to do a deeper dive on what proportional scoring means specific to you. This is absolutely something that we cover um, when requested or when we know a team is heading to a major event that uses proportional scoring. Uh, we usually break this out even with their past results. So don't hesitate to, to ask questions, get in touch with us, um, and we will absolutely uh, be willing to sit down and go through this with you because when we are all more educated about how to do well at our competitions, the quality of the competition improves the quality of the cadets experience improves, everything improves alongside it. So hopefully this has been helpful for you in understanding what proportional scoring is and kind of some of the examples and the takeaways uh, that we can learn from it once we truly understand what's going on with those pesky numbers. So again, thanks for hanging with us. Check us out drill-dynamics.com and hit us up with any questions you might have. And we will talk to y'all later. Ben.